On today's show, I have a guest on named Raymond Heckmat. Raymond is a family and uh, marriage planning attorney in Beverly Hills. His practice is focused on couples successfully entering their marriages with well-planned and cooperative prenuptial agreements. And when marriage doesn't work out, as it sometimes doesn't, he assists his clients move on with their lives through divorce consulting and mediation services. He's super fun. He's very funny and he's very sharp. And I am uh, sure that you're going to love hearing his approach to prenuptials as well as divorce mediation in this episode. You're listening to the Relationship Revival Podcast with John DeBach, also known as Mr. Spirituality. That's me. I'm your host giving you insights and guidance from over 10 years in the field of this amazing journey we call romance. On this show, I go over everything you need to know about how to get into a relationship, how to get the most out of a relationship, and sometimes even how to gracefully end a relationship without pulling your hair out and going crazy. And occasionally, I'm even joined by new and old friends who are also relationship experts to bring you guidance and wisdom with new perspectives. Thanks for stopping by. The whole point of this uh, podcast series where I'm interviewing divorce or family law attorneys is to kind of get a peek under the rug, see what it really is like for people who might be considering a divorce or considering going into marriage and what they need to know legally uh, to protect their rights. And I loved when I went to your website and when we discussed kind of before interviewing you have a different approach than your classic divorce lawyer. You have kind of a, a one of your emphasis is on prenuptial agreements, and you also do divorce mediation. Why don't you go ahead and kind of tell us and everybody who's listening what your practice is comprised of and why you decided to structure it this way? Because it isn't your classic, you know, divorce attorney, you know, firm. Yeah. So I. Uh... After I passed the bar and I went into family law, I worked for a couple different firms that were focused on divorce litigation. And for about, I want to say, seven or eight years, my practice, all I was doing was litigation. Fight, fight, fight. Going to court almost three, four times a week. Uh, and, yeah. and when I started my own practice, I did it for the first year or two. And I just realized that... I realized two things, honestly. One was... It wasn't who I was as a person. I was finding that mm -hmm. I was becoming someone that I didn't want to be. I'm not that bulldog attorney that wants to ruin people's lives that many family law attorneys are. <laughs> and and on the sec and and I saw the and then the second part, I saw all the collateral damage that was happening through divorce litigation. And what I mean by that is when two people are getting divorced and they're going through a really tough time and they're fighting and they're litigating the damage that is caused is not only between the two of them but as the family as a whole most importantly the children and i saw how litigation could negatively impact the kids of divorce and honestly i didn't want to play a part in that and i saw that there were better options out there and and look there are some cases that require that litigation but yeah but so many times things could be settled, things can be resolved with communication and two attorneys trusting each other and working collaboratively to help people just move on with their lives. And things were like, attorneys make mountains out of molehills, honestly, to make money. I mean, I, I found that in litigation, there's a true conflict of interest because as a litigation attorney, the more I fight, the more I make money. And I, I didn't want to be a part of that. So about, I want to say now it's about six years ago, I decided to shift my practice to divorce consulting, mediation, and prenuptial agreements. And the divorce consulting and mediation go kind of hand in hand where uh, when parties are in mediation, uh, I work with one of the parties as a consultant, uh, divorce consultant, where I help them strategize settlement, strategize for the mediation, give them the knowledge they need to knowingly enter into uh, the mediations, let them know what their legal rights are, their obligations, sometimes even talking them off the ledge of making unreasonable demands that can kind of take the mediation off the right path. Um, mm -hmm. 
And I found a lot of value in that because you're truly just helping people get control of their own lives and through the mediation process. Uh, and as a mediator, I do the same thing. I just work as an unbiased third party facilitating those conversations. And I find there's meaning in that because when you're going through a divorce, it's important for couples to have that control in their lives rather than, as my old mentor said, giving the power to a stranger in a black muumuu to make decisions about your <laughs> life and your family's life, right? It's right. important for you to make those decisions on your own. So what... When you're a mediator, you're not representing either party, correct? correct. You're representing both I don't, sides I don't represent anyone. I don't represent anyone. I'm an unbiased third party that helps the two of them facilitate conversations and uh, come to a resolution on the issues of their case. So I'll point out what issues need to be resolved. I may tell them what the law provides, how things would be calculated, uh, what other professionals we may need to come in to do accounting or appraisals or valuations and i and i kind of walk them through that process and help them make those decisions now we had someone on the show recently who is a therapist by trade and she also does divorce mediation hmm. so i guess my question is do you know what the difference is i mean it, you know to me as a relationship counselor it's like the the divorce attorney being a mediator seems like a natural solution have you ever dealt with a therapist who is also a divorce mediator or is that like a new concept to you as well that's a new concept to me i i mean i've i've worked with many divorce coaches so there are divorce coaches uh -huh. out there that help with the emotional side of divorce and help sure. you through that process um there are some mediators that don't have any legal experience or aren't lawyers that i guess can help mediate uh, sure. But as a lawyer, I know what the law is. I know what the issues are. Uh, and you in can a way, suggest I, things that kind of fall into the purview of being legal and binding. Well, sure. It's a legal process yeah. and I'm helping people through that legal process. Uh, I would be weary of anyone without a legal degree. I mean, as a mediator, I'm not necessarily practicing law, but there are legal issues. It's a legal process that I'm helping people go through. Yeah. So, uh, Very interesting. And I'm sure the line gets blurred with you as well as a mediator where you kind of act as a therapist at times too almost because it's an emotional experience. Well, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I tell people all the time that I would say about as a consultant, as a mediator, or even as a litigation attorney, family law attorneys, I would say about 60 to 70 percent of our job is being a therapist. I'm not trained to be a therapist. I don't have a license in therapy. But right. based out of my experiences and who I am as a person, 60 to 70% of what I do is therapy. The other 30% is legal. Uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're helping people through a really, really tough time in their lives. And it's a huge transition. And there's a lot going on. And, uh, and oh, as attorneys, we're there as a helping hand, as support in any way, in any way we can. I get phone calls where... We'll talk for an hour and maybe 10 minutes of it has to do with legal issues and the rest of it is just about life and about how things are going to look like at the end of the road at the, and where is that light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, yeah. So you have to have a – if you have your approach that you have where you're not a litigator and you're not this bulldog fighting – you kind of have a much different emotional role because <laughs> you're not just kind of gearing them up for a fight. Yeah, it's and there's a, totally a lot of bull style. and there's a lot of bulldog attorneys that don't have the time to talk about the therapy stuff and talk about feelings and emotions. You know, they right. they're focused on the case and they're focused on winning and they're focused on the facts and the evidence and they want to get to that and that's that's their job and that's what they should be doing. But I found right. that a lot of times clients. That's all fine and dandy, but clients need that emotional support as well. And I, I fully support my clients going to therapy or having a divorce coach because that sure. professional support is very necessary. But yeah. I think yeah. they go hand in hand many, many times. Yeah, especially if you have the mentality that you're there as supportive of even if they do go to a coach or a therapist, you're another ear that they can bend another kind of voice of reason for sure absolutely let me ask you this what kind of clients because it's a different type of person that would seek a mediator versus a litigant you know a right. litigation attorney 
who do you find to be really good kind of candidates for seeking mediation? Because the people who listen to this show, they might be in a, in a tough spot. And I believe that not every relationship can be saved. Sure. Um, you know, if you put all your work in and you're the best partner in the world and your other partner is checked out, at the end of the day, you can't control them. So it's like sometimes it's inevitable that you do have to split up. When do they, what's the sign? What's the, what are the, like the, the good criteria of like mediation is a good way to go versus litigation? So I think the first thing is that two people have realized that their relationship is no longer working, but they continue to communicate well and they respect each other and they are, their understanding of the situation and they both want to move on. They both understand the, value of moving on. You know, I, I tell my clients all the time when we're getting divorced, we do a community property balance sheet. We're dealing with a lot of financial issues, but there's a lot of valuable assets that aren't on that community property balance sheet. And one of them is the value of moving on with your life. And uh, a good, ca- good candidates for mediation communicate with each other, have that understanding of what that value is, want to work together to move on, uh, respect each other and their family and, and want to avoid that damage that could occur from a litigation. Um, I really think that's the most important issue because again, mediation is totally voluntary. Uh, yeah. It requires two people to voluntarily decide that they want to work together to kind of dissolve this marriage and deal with those financial issues. Um, yeah. And I'm assuming because it's voluntary and because it's uh, you know, the two people are on the same page that it's probably a shorter process as well and probably even more affordable, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because when you're litigating, you're dealing with not only your attorney's calendar in juggling so many cases and trials in court hearings and this and that, but you're also dealing with the court's calendar. So if issues need to be resolved and you file a motion in court, it's not going to be heard for another three to four months. Right. Right. And that's only on one issue. And then if you, God forbid, you have to go to trial, trials aren't set for another year, you know, and and they're working on getting that system faster and dedicating courtrooms for long term trials. But but it's a long process. On the other hand, mediation, you have more control in moving things forward, moving things at your own pace as you want. If you have resolution and you know what you guys are going to agree on. You can move a lot faster uh, in the mediation process. And yeah, it is a lot cheaper because you're paying, you're paying a mediator their hourly rate for those mediation sessions and any work that's done outside of mediation. Mm-hmm. And I always advise my clients to hire those consulting attorneys. But again, those right. consulting attorneys are not filing motions. They're not doing discovery. They're not writing letters. They're not calling the attorneys. You know, I, I find that a lot of litigation... Uh, a lot of clients that are going through litigation, they'll get a bill at the end of the month and they're, and they're like, wait a minute, when did you do all of this work? I haven't yeah. seen any of the work product. You talk to the other to attorney for an hour and a half. What did you guys talk about for an hour and a half? You know, so, right. but, but as a consulting or attorney or a mediator, as a mediator, when you get the bill at the end of the month, you, you know what that time was spent on because th- you asked for that work to be done and that's it. So there's a lot more clarity. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Is there a typical timeline for mediation? Is it like it normally lasts two months, six months, or is it all over the map because it depends on the couple? It's all over the map because it depends on the couple. I've had certain people that hire me and we have one, one or two hour session and we're done. Like they already agreed on everything, even as complicated as having like three to four pieces of, property and some bank accounts and cars and kids, but they know what they wanted to do. And we were done in within two hours and that's it. And we're drafting up a judgment and we're moving on. There are others that things are a little bit more intricate. We have to get appraisals. There's differences of opinion of what a business might be valued at, or, or we have issues in co-parenting. We have different styles of co-parenting. How do we resolve our differences with an agreement that we're both okay with and that we're willing to move on with? How often would you say, you know, to a couple that comes in thinking that they can do mediation, 
takes a hard turn in the middle of a mediation session and says, mm, maybe we should be considering litigation. Yeah, it happens once in a while. And, and, okay. and that's okay because, I mean, you've given it a shot. You've tried to yep. work things out, right? Uh, but it happens once in a while where maybe new information comes up. Maybe certain things happen while we're in mediation. Uh, maybe you learn that you don't really trust your partner as much as you thought you did. And, uh, and trust is a huge part of mediation because we're not here to do discovery or find out secrets, right? Uh, right. Everyone is supposed to be on their best behavior, present all of the information that they're asked to present and do it properly and, uh, and accurately. So if someone says that their income is 5,000 a month, but you really think that it's closer to 20 and they're really yeah. sticking to that five, well, at that point, there's not much for me to do as a mediator. Uh, right. We could maybe hire a joint forensic accountant to, to evaluate that, but they would have to both agree to that. Uh, but, when I, I find that when people are in mediation, then they really just stick to their guns and they're focused on winning. That's yeah. when things can go awry. So that's the red flag. If someone has that competition type of mentality and it's about me versus you and I'm winning or losing. Right. Yeah. Right. Mediation right. is not about winning. Mediation is about coming to an agreement and moving on. And, Got it. and some of the best settlement officers we work with always say that, uh, and I mean, any negotiation, if both parties walk away unhappy, it probably means we came to a good resolution. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard that too. I've heard that in the past. Well, you know what? I think this is a good, a good point. Cause you, you talked about how it's not about winning, which is, which is something I tell all my kind of relationship clients is like, if you have this idea that I was right and you were wrong, that's kind of a recipe for disaster within the relationship. Right. And I think this is a good point kind of to talk about prenuptial agreements and what, you know, what a prenuptial ad agreement can do to help a married couple kind of enter into a marriage the right way. Absolutely. So we'll start from the start. <laughs> when, when you get married, it's a legal contract. Uh, mm -hmm. And you're, su you're succumbed to the laws of California. The yep. laws of California, and I practice in California, so I can only speak to California. But the laws of sure. California are, is your prenup. So whether you like it or not, you're going to have a prenup. So what happens is that when you get married, it's actually your first and as I know, your only opportunity to really create your own laws of your life and your marriage. And what you're able to do mm -hmm. with a prenuptial agreement is to rewrite those laws in a way that works for your, the both of you in your relationship and they work best for your relationship. Because community property laws don't really work for everyone. They're just boilerplate laws that have certain values and yeah. they apply those values to everyone as a boilerplate. But Every relationship is different. Every relationship dynamic is different. And, and it's an opportunity to reevaluate that relationship dynamic. So what a prenuptial, the way I do prenuptial agreements, I actually see it as an opportunity to build a really strong foundation in your marriage. And, and what I mean by that is when I see people getting divorced, a large reason, a big reason why people get divorced is about money. Mm -hmm. And it may be differences in opinion about how money should be spent, saved, yeah. uh, what does money mean to you, uh, expectations and roles and responsibilities in the marriage. And these are all things that should absolutely be discussed before you get married. And yeah. people avoid that because they say, oh, that's not romantic. Or what if we find out that we, we don't align with it? And you know what? That's okay. That's yeah. a good thing. You know, I tell people, and we've, I've done prenuptial agreements where we go through that process and they realize they're not right for each other. And, yeah. and that's a win-win situation. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, yeah. you either go through that process and you align and you realize like, this is how we're going to live our marital life and our finances during our marriage. Or you realize we're on completely separate opposite ends and we're not right for each other. And that's, yeah. they're both win-win situations. Yeah, um, for sure. So I, I, encourage my clients to talk to their partners about the prenuptial agreement. What are the, what do those conversations sound like? What do you actually talk about during prenuptial conversations? So on my website, I have a, 
I have a conversation conversation starter package that uh-huh. kind of goes through questions and conversation starters about money. So I think the first thing to do is to talk about money. Talk about not even about the prenup, but about what you guys think your life is going to look like together. What are your roles and responsibilities? What are your expectations of each other? How much money? What are your values? How much money do you make? How much money do I make? Do we want to live in a house? Are we okay in a condo? Are we planning to have kids? How many? Private school? What What do all of those things look like? Right? What kind of debt you're coming into the marriage with, right? Absolutely. You know, what is your credit score? You know, right. things like that. Do you get, what, what is your involvement of money with your family? Do you get gifts on a regular basis? Are those yeah. gifts going to be ours or are they going to be yours? What are you going right. to do with that money? What do you plan on investing? What, do you, what are your goals in your, my, your financial goals in your life, right? Yeah. So the first thing is to talk about that kind of stuff and try to understand where each of you is coming from. Now, once you have those conversations, a prenuptial agreement can really only deal with financial matters in terms of income and assets. Uh-huh. And so it's, the conversations are, okay, we have certain assets that we're coming in with. What do we want to do with those assets? Do we want to keep them separate? Do we want the community to be able to gain an interest in them? How are we going to manage these assets that we're coming into the marriage with, right? Then... There are, okay, well, now that we have that, what about the assets we acquire during marriage? How is that going to look? Are those right. going to be separate? Are they going to be community? Is there going to be a hybrid situation where we consciously decide to create community property rather than things being automatically created like California law? And, right. and so th- that's the asset and debt conversation. And then there's a the conversation about income, right? These days, people have income from many different sources, whether it's passive income from prior to marriage or active income from employment during marriage. How do we want our income to be characterized? Do we want it all to be community property? Do we want it to just be my money, your money? What's yours is yours. What's mine is mine. Do we Mm -hmm. want a hybrid situation again where you make your money, I make my money, but we'll put some money in a joint pot and then we'll do stuff with that, right? So. Those are kind of the questions we go through in terms of assets, income, and then we sometimes talk about, okay, if we buy a house together, what is that going to look like? If we invest together, we start a business together, what are those things going to look like, you know? Very much, yeah. And those conversations are so valuable. I tell people, you know, because this comes up in dating, it comes up in marriages all the time with me too. And you're right. People say this isn't romantic. I don't like talking about it. It's uncomfortable. And I always tell people clarity and transparency is the most romantic thing you can be. Absolutely. Because if you know your partner, that's that's everything. Well, I, I, I mean, look, first of all, I think that having these, cre- these conversations creates intimacy, right? Sure. Getting married is a very intimate relationship. And you're getting intimate in, in every possible way. To right. leave money on the table and say, ah, we're not going to get intimate about money, I think is mm-hmm. a huge mistake. Because whether you like it or not, at some point in your marriage, you're going to talk about money, if yeah. not every month, maybe even every day. It's going to yeah. happen. You're, you can't avoid it. And, and look, and you're married, I'm like, marriage can be uncomfortable. Yeah. That's just real life. That's called yeah. real life. Marriage yeah. is not a beautiful wedding. We're in love and everything is perfect. That's not marriage. Yeah. Uh, marriage involves a lot of changes. It, it involves uh, children. It involves illnesses. It involves deaths. It involves ups and downs in your career and income and relying on each other and ebbs and flows that, that are maybe expected or unexpected, right? And it's having these conversations from the beginning that kind of act as a training tool on how you're going to resolve it during the marriage. I I see it as like working on your car, right? You buy a new car, it's absolutely perfect in every possible way. But if you don't work on it, you don't service it, you don't change the oil, it's going to die down and it's going to stop working, right? So these conversations are, are a training tool to be open about those conversations even during your marriage and to approach When conflict arises during your marriage, you're able to approach those conflicts with from a place of understanding rather than 
conflict and defensiveness. Because yeah. now yeah. you understand where your partner is coming from. What is their relationship with money? What does money mean to them? And, and, and as Esther Perel has always said, fights about money are never about money. It's not about yeah. the money. It's about your values on the money. It's about mm-hmm. what it means to you. What, how did you grow up with it, right? And yep. if you have that real true understanding about your partner, you're able to have these conversations in a much more fruitful manner. That's great. That's great. I love the approach. I think it's totally in line with, with everything that I tell my clients all the time. I think that, you know, I'll probably be referring some people to you at this point because it's like if I, if I could back up the way I teach people have have relationships with someone who can kind of make it kind of in a legal framework for them so they understand this, you know, if they take that mentality into every aspect of their marriage, it's just a great way right. to – to kind of go through and make sure that that the conflicts are avoided because there's an openness, there's a willingness to talk about these things. It's important to note, the conflicts won't be avoided. They'll just be approached proactively and uh, and they'll be more fruitful, right? Yeah. They'll be more, the, they're going to be more productive yeah. rather than destructive. Conflict. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure, for sure. What, since you've been, since, it's so interesting because you see people at the beginning and at the end stages of their marriage. What, what's some of the most surprising things that you've seen or learned about marriage through your divorce consulting? Uh, I mean, going back to it, not sound like a broken record, but the most surprising thing I've learned is that people really didn't know what they were getting themselves into. They yeah. didn't have those conversations about money with their partner. So they didn't understand what to, they, they had certain expectations in their head mm-hmm. that they were going to live a certain life because my spouse is a doctor or a lawyer or owns this big company or has family money or this and that. And they have these expectations of how their marriage is going to look. Mm-hmm. And then it doesn't look that way. And they're right. like, well, wait a minute, but you can't blame you can't blame the other side. It's like you never asked for that. You never talked about it. You never said, right. this is what I expect in my life, right? So yeah. it's really surprising to me that people enter marriages without those conversations, without that understanding. Uh, it's, like and, walking in, it's like walking into a relationship blindfolded. Absolutely. And, and they yeah. just rely on love. And look, you should love your partner. You should yeah. absolutely share that love. But... but in many well, ways, part of love marriage is, is, is a, making sure it's secure, making well, sure there's, there's well, marriage is also there. it's, it's also look, whether you like it or not, getting married is a business partnership. Yep. It is. And I, I tell the, the kind of joke I tell people is, you know, if you're married with kids, it'll feel like a nonprofit that you're not getting paid <laughs> to work in. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and that creates its own stresses. And and you're, you have to manage through those and you have to have an understanding of how you're going to deal with them, right? So I think that's the that's one thing. Um, it's also I, it all comes down to communication. I think people people are surprised when their sexual intimacy is not the way that they expected, or sure. or that the family relationships aren't what they expected. Yeah, and it all yeah. comes down to the fact that you never talked about it to begin with, and. Mm-hmm. Dating is very different from being engaged and being engaged is extremely different than being married and then being married with children is very different than just being married single, right? And we go through these stages in life and at every single stage that communication needs to continue happening and people just expect that the person I married at 25 is going to be the same person that I married that I married to at 40 with children, right? Right. That's not going to happen. Never happen. We all change. We yeah. all have new lives, you know? I mean, my wife and I were talking about it last night. This is the longest relationship her and I have ever been in. Sure. We've been married for almost eight or nine years, eight years. It's the longest relationship we've ever been in. Mm-hmm. We, we haven't We've never been in a relationship this long. We don't know what that means. This is the first time I'm, mi- I'm with someone that I have children with. So yeah. I don't know how to navigate that. We're learning as we go. And to have the expectation that 
your spouse is going to be the same person they were when you married them in the first place, that's also surprising to me because yeah. you have to have that understanding that things do change. And People that, just assume that they're that it'll just happen by osmosis. You wake up next to your partner and you'll just understand who they are, but they require right. conversations. They require right. that communication. And that's why I, I kind of question some of the people that say we grew out of love. Um, I question it, but also understand it. I question it because that just means that you didn't try to communicate and try to get on the same level and try to understand mm -hmm. where the other person is coming from to try to, and what one of our mentors used to say, you got to give a shit about what your spouse gives a shit about. Sorry, I yeah. don't know if I'm allowed to cuss here. But. That's okay. Yeah, no, not by all means. <laughs> so, I don't think any kids are listening to this. There anymore. you go. So, <laughs> and, and that's really important. Some people just choose to stop giving a shit about what their spouse shit, gives a shit about when it's something yeah. new or different, right? Yeah. And, and so I question it because you're not growing together and you're not growing separately. And I believe that that's important too. But I also understand it because as we grow up, our needs change. Yeah. Our expectations change. Our lives yeah. change. Your and, values change. Everything and changes. And everything changes. So yeah. if you're no longer on that same page, I can understand it as well. There's no such thing as stagnation in a relationship. You're either Absolutely. growing or shrinking in your intimacy. You have to work towards the growth. Otherwise, things start to collapse. There's no such thing as just status quo. Absolutely. Every day is a new thing. I totally Absolutely. Think. Raymond, it's been an unbelievable pleasure. I, I love your perspective on this. I love that you're an attorney who cares and that you clearly like just want to help people have great relationships. It's a breath of fresh air. I'm talking to a lot of attorneys, so I'm sure I'll hear some who kind of share your, your mentality. <laughs> but but um, yeah. if you want to reach out to, to Raymond, you can go to heckmatfamilylaw.com. That's H-E-K-M-A-T familylaw.com. He has his social media links there and his, and his really useful kind of how to talk about money guide that, you, that he mentioned that I'm going to take a look at and probably keep in my arsenal for, for clients as well. If you're interested in learning how to get the absolute most out of your romantic relationships, then you're in luck because I have put together a free workshop or masterclass, if you will, about three secrets that people in happy relationships have discovered. You can view the workshop at mrspirituality.com slash three secrets. Again, it's completely free. Just go there and watch it. It'll help you on your journey, give you some wisdom, some things to think about. The website again is mrspirituality.com slash three secrets. That's mrspirituality.com slash the number three, the word secrets. It's all yours. Enjoy.